All right, let's turn to Luke chapter 12. We've been going through this gospel together over the past few weeks. And um, I was visiting with a few people at the funeral or uh, memorial service yesterday and just mentioning how different Mark and Luke are when you read them back to back. Mark is so succinct and very, uh, like I, I noticed, especially during sections, the word immediately pops up all the yeah. time. And uh, I think you have to, I haven't really, really um, studied Mark, uh, you know, in depth. I should maybe do that next. But I mean, not cool. necessarily with you guys. I'm saying. Oh. <laughs> It'd be a shorter series at least. Right? <laughs> this is like our fourth oh, installment of Luke, but. But Luke is just more detailed, a lot longer chapters. Uh, and that's not like Luke wrote the chapters out, I know, but uh, a more um, just a different style of writing. And as I look through Luke, I think it just does require a little more time because of all of those things in it. And we didn't quite finish the section from verses 8 through 12. So I wanted to go back to that and spend some time. Uh, sort of reviewing. If you weren't here last week, um, we really were kind of taking some time on trying to understand what bl blasphemy against the Holy Spirit is. And we'll talk a little bit about that again. But then um, want to make sure we don't skip over verses 11 through 12. And, and, um, and then we'll, we'll move on to the next section. So let's read together from verses 8 through 12 of this chapter, chapter 12. Jesus is speaking. I tell you, everyone who acknowledges me before men, the son of man, also will acknowledge before the angels of God. But the one who denies me before men will be denied before the angels of God. And everyone who speaks a word against the son of man will be forgiven. But the one who blasphemes against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven. And when they bring you before the synagogues and the rulers and the authorities, do not be anxious about how you should defend yourself or what you should say, for the Holy Spirit will teach you in that very hour what you ought to say. In verse 10, uh, we'll get to that in a moment um, about everyone who speaks a word against the Son of Man will be forgiven. Just to give you kind of a, a reminder about this, when Jesus crucified even, he said, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. There's just kind of an interesting juxtaposition. Jesus was willing to forgive kind of that ignorance of what these people were doing to him. And we think about how forgiving God is. It is overwhelming to think about it, especially if we think about it from what we're like. If we consider how offended we can be, how how um, upset we are when, when someone rightly offends us. I mean, not rightly, but when we truly have been offended. You get the idea? Um, just to think about how Jesus had this extent of forgiveness, how he had compassion to really forgive those. But Jesus also is stern about warnings too, to say, let's like, that is such a great amount of forgiveness. Let's not forget that God has the, the justice that there are points at which at this point, at least they're not forgiven. And we studied a little bit how how do we understand a blasphemy against the Holy Spirit? It seems to be a sin against the person of the Holy Spirit. And I even think that this does tie into this testifying. The role of the Holy Spirit is to testify to our hearts about Jesus Christ. The role of the Holy Spirit is to testify about the Father. We think about the Trinity. We see this as the role of these persons 
There's a subservient role within the Trinity even. Uh, I think that's biblical. It's, it, I wouldn't dare say it if it wasn't in God's word that, the, that Jesus was humbled to obey the Father. But the Spirit also is described as being that which is under the Son and testifying to the Son. Now, if the Holy Spirit testifies to who Jesus Christ is, if the Holy Spirit is the one that says, it, who speaks into your heart to know who Jesus is. And you would be like those in chapter 11 who would then say that Jesus is, has the power of the devil. That speaks again, that is completely reverse of what the spirit does in our hearts. And so it is to not just sin against who Jesus is, it's to sin against who God is testifying to who Jesus is in your heart. If, if in your heart, you will attribute then the work of God to Satan, then you are blaspheming the Holy Spirit. I still don't know that I really, you know, fully understand this. I think the scriptures don't give us much more than this, but we humbly try to understand it the best we can. And, and, um, I think that that idea of testifying before men, we are called, what does it mean to acknowledge God before men? I thought about that a little bit. You know, what's interesting, I think, is he's implying that maybe some of you think you believe in me, but when you're, when you're asked publicly if you believe, you're ashamed. You know, I think that acknowledgement of Jesus is to say, I won't shy away from the world and what they could do to me. And Jesus is warning them, if, if you're ashamed of me, then I won't, you know, then I'm ashamed of you. Mm-hmm. And so, um, and even that can be forgiven as we see in Peter. But um, that's where I think the connection of verses four through seven <clears throat> connect to verses eight and nine. What does it mean to deny the Lord? Sometimes it's in our words because we, we want to keep our mouths shut. We're afraid of the world and what they may do to us. But Jesus has said uh, earlier, if you fear God and you truly fear God, you have nothing to fear. Because then you can uh, acknowledge God before men. Because you're not going to worry because God's going to take care of you. God's going to give you everything you need in your moment of trial to withstand. And there's an interesting story about um, this Englishman, uh, Cramer, Cramner, Cranmer. He was um, very influential as um, Great Britain was going through this issue between the, the the monarchy and the church of England. And he got put kind of in the vice because he was that go between. And for the most part, Thomas was faithful to the Lord. And he, he um, was instrumental in writing down things that were important for the church to be able to continue to do, to be faithful to the Lord apart from whatever a king or a queen might say, but there was a point in which he sort of recanted and he, he, uh, he was afraid of dying and martyring for his faith. However, in the end, he very uh, soon before his death, he, he stood up for the Lord. He was not, he was ashamed of what he had done and he went back to what he knew was true. And I think of that as sort of what maybe can happen in our lives, where there are moments of weakness where our lives do deny the Lord by our actions, but we come back and we, we, we know that is not what we want our public statement to be. And that's what our desire is. And um, the comfort that we have is that the Holy Spirit Instead of blaspheming the Holy Spirit, 
recognize the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Look at verses 11 and 12. So when you're, when you're afraid, when you're afraid, trust in what God has said to not fear because his Holy Spirit will be with you. And when they bring you before the synagogues and the rulers and the authorities, do not be anxious about how you should defend yourself or what you should say. So when you get in the pinch, don't be afraid. For the Holy Spirit will teach you in that very hour what you ought to say. And uh, there's a, a passage that I think we know from uh, 1 Peter 3. And I'll just read it. I know you guys know this verse. Um, but I think this verse can also go along with the one that we just read about the Holy Spirit. Um, first Peter three, verse 15, we read, but in your hearts, honor Christ, the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you yet do it with gentleness and respect. So we want to be prepared, but you, you don't have to worry if you're not quite prepared, right? This is kind of that reminder. The Holy Spirit will work with you to be prepared, and we ought to be prepared. But there's also the comfort to know that if you don't seem prepared, if you don't think you're prepared, the Holy Spirit is with you. Um, so we can pray in that moment. We ought to pray in that moment for the Holy Spirit. We ought to pray for the Lord to uh, fulfill his promises to us, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And so um, that's the comfort is that if we're concerned about our inadequ inadequacies, if we're afraid um, that we might not be willing to stand in a time of trial, to pray for the Holy Spirit, to teach us what to do at that time and to trust in him and not be anxious. Just want to pause. Uh, maybe some of you guys have already been thinking a little bit about um, this section. And so before we move on, I wanted to just open it up in case you had further questions or comments that you wanted to share. You think how Jesus was brought in that, that phony trial with those false accusers uh, illegally, middle of the night, uh, mm -hmm. High priests were supposed to be preparing their families for Passover, participating in Passover, very holy time. They were totally consumed and out of their mind, insane to, to kill him, an innocent man. They knew he was innocent, and he was brought before them, false accusers and everything. And see how he responded. Now, we're to respond, and we've been in situations where uh, our flesh... In our intelligence, we want to rely upon our intelligence and our ways of reasoning. But we're dealing with the spiritual battle. And how Christ, he didn't, he didn't point out, hey, that guy's lying over there. And that false witness over there, he wasn't even in, in the premises, you know, under his eyewitness all this. He didn't do any of that. And we're to trust in the Lord when we get in tough circumstances to guard our tongues and how we're to respond, you know. Because uh, you know, a lot of times my mother, I had to protect her, you know, and I, the doctors would say, you know, I just wanted to kick back, you know, mm -hmm. some of the things, you know, or I, just my natural, how I, you know, how I've been, you all have natural tendencies about stuff, you know. Mm -hmm. So I go over, I just pray when I get to the parking garage, I just pray about it. Mm -hmm. I'll guard, guard my tongue, mm -hmm. you know. Because you don't know what to say. And some of these things, we get in situations with, uh, thankful I've never been in court, but I mean, you know, you get in these situations where, what do you do? I've been unjustly treated. How can I let them, what do I say? Mm -hmm. And they're not going to listen to me anyway. But we have to trust in the Lord that he will work it out. He will use our little crayon drawings to make sense to these geniuses, you know. He's going to fix it. And we got to trust in him. And we have to represent him to the world because the world is in total darkness. Mm -hmm. They are so completely blind, leading us down here to say one plus one equals eight. Mm -hmm. You know, and if we don't believe that on Tuesday, it's going to be nine on Thursday, you know. And we're supposed to 
be light to them in this dark world, you know? And how do we do that? We argue and persuade, use our intelligence, but we have to pray about it, that the Holy Spirit will take control of our lives and our speech and use our words. He wants us to say something. Sometimes he doesn't want us to say something, but we're to respond the way he wants us to, not the way we want to. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thanks. John? Yeah, just to piggyback on that a little bit, uh, I think we, uh, I'd like to extend this to don't be intimidated. Uh, you want to talk to your neighbor, don't be intimidated. Uh, don't worry about what you have to say. The Holy Spirit will be with you. Or if you want to then go into the neighborhood and talk to strangers, don't be intimidated because the Holy Spirit will give you the words to say. Of course, that does, then you go back to Peter and say you'd be prepared to uh, be prepared to go, but don't let that stop you because you don't know what to say. You know, I think uh, too often that happens with us. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's well, an extension of the passage, I understand. But. Yeah, no, I think that it does apply in that case, too. Um, well, let's let's keep going to the next section here. Some of the crowd said to him, someone in the crowd said to him, teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. But he said to him, man, who made me a judge or arbitrator over you? And he said to them. Take care and be on your guard against all covetousness, for one's life does not consist of the abundance of his possessions. And he told them a parable, saying, The land of a rich man produced plentifully. And he thought to himself, What shall I do? For I have nowhere to store my crops. And he said, I will do this. I will tear down my barns and build larger ones. And there I will store all my grain and my goods. And I will say to my soul, Soul, you have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax, eat, drink, be merry. But God said to him, fool, this night your soul is required of you and the things you have prepared, whose will they be? So is the one who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. Now, I think that if you think through the first part of the chapter, he was teaching them about hypocrisy. And that did flow into verses 4 through 12, I think. If you kind of, you know, are willing to roll around in your mind a little bit, you can see how hypocrisy will put you in a weird spot when now your, your life is on the line. <laughs> now it's going to expose you a little bit. Are you, which side of that line are you going to fall on when it comes to who Jesus is? Because you may have been faking it pretty good on the outside. But what if it's going to cost you your reputation? What if people are going to make fun of you? Oh, now you'll just flip it around, right? Now, oh, I'm in a different crowd. Now I have to pretend to be uh, an unbeliever. And then, like, you know, just hopefully inside I'm, I'm still with the Lord. You know, it's. That was exposed. But now, now the next subject is kind of a, a combination of things, but it, it starts with covetousness. And we've been talking a little bit about the antithesis. There's, there's, a, there's a point. There's an edge here. And we're going to kind of look at what this, how, how do we make sure we fall on the right side of God's kingdom when it comes to worldly possessions, when it comes to the things that we have in our lives, how do we view them? We see this person in the crowd saying to Jesus, teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. And, um, you know, it's sort of like, look, Jesus, fix this for me. You know, I've got a problem. And uh, Jesus does not seem interested in getting involved. Why not? Why do you think Jesus is a little bit, it seems kind of a little short in terms of how he responds um, I don't think he's necessarily annoyed, but he's like, who made me 
judge and arbiter over this? Why is Jesus not that excited to help this man out? What do you think? Maybe he has false, false motives when he asked him the question. Yeah. What else could it be? Are there already courts and <laughs> things established for that purpose? Yeah, yeah, sort of like, you know, you want me to just take care of this for you too? I mean, why don't you just deal with it, you know, with the civil law, civil magistrate? It, it almost seems like a tattletale scenario of, you know, and this guy thinks he's been unjustly dealt with by his brother. Um, so Jesus, Jesus uses it into a teachable moment, right? That's what we call these as educators, teachable moment. And uh, he's like, I'll tell you what, I'm not going to help you with that, but I'm going to help you with that. Let me help you with that. You get it? And this is how the Bible speaks to you and me, because you might be like, well, I don't have a tr I don't have trouble with this. And Jesus could say, well, maybe we do. Maybe I do have trouble with this, even if it's not about inheritance. Maybe it's not about uh, being unjustly dealt with. I probably have something that needs to be uncovered here. So Jesus, the perfect teacher, says, take care. That means watch out. Be on your guard against all covetousness. And that word covetousness implies excess. The, the, the idea here is, you know, if somebody's really hungry and they want food, they're not necessarily coveting something that, that they need, right? That's, I think we can all see uh, biblically that it doesn't mean any wants that you have in life are coveting. If, if you're hungry and you're poor and you have needs, that's not to covet something, but when you, when you want more and more, and the idea here is you can't be satisfied by it. It's like you're always hungry. Your appetite never stops. Now, there's small amounts of this and large amounts of this, but that covetousness is the wanting of something that you don't have, wanting something that would make you or you think would make you happy. Um, and I guess if we're thinking about this, what is the opposite of covetousness? Contentment. Right. Contentment, um, being satisfied. And you know, it's really interesting. I learned this actually from a dietitian: is that when you eat something not good for you, usually the, the biggest thrill is that first and second bite. Right. I mean, it just pops the brain into this is so good. But the last bite of the candy bar isn't that good. And so her theory is just take one, two bites and walk away from it. Because you're not actually going to get the same endorphin spin from bite three, four, five and six. And that's true of a lot of things, unless you just really decide to enjoy. You can. But isn't that how a lot of gifts are? And then uh, six months later, it's just in the cupboard with all the other cool appliances. You're making smoothies every day for a month. Your bread machine was really cool for a while. The thing you could buff your car with, now you're just taking it in and getting it clean by somebody else. It just does not last. Covetousness exposes that the thing we wanted maybe wasn't that valuable. So we want to ponder this in our lives. When are we falling into covetousness? When are our wants, when are our desires just a sign of not being content and satisfied with what the Lord gives us. That's the challenge with things. Now, sometimes we talk about this more about idolatry. Yes, this is kind of like idolatry, but this is a sin. Like, you know, like there is a difference in the Ten Commandments between the sins. They're all related and they're all one thing. When we break one, we break them all. But we also can see covetousness outside of idolatry. It's just a not being satisfied with what the Lord's provision for us has been or what's really enough. Right. Um, it's funny because like. I, I'm kind of um, overly frugal, 
So sometimes after I go to an expensive restaurant, I'm like, man, I'm going to get hungry in three hours. And I just, <laughs> waste, I just blew a bunch of money. Sheesh. You know, like, and I, so when I spend money, I'm sort of like, how much am I really going to be satisfied with that expense? Because I'm still going to come home and, you know, so it's tricky. I, I, uh, I don't know. Anyway, I digress a little bit, but just, I want us to ponder that idea of what covetousness is and what the, the sin is. And it's just interesting how it leads to problems. When you make a lot of money, you got to pay a lot of taxes. You know how much time people spend trying to like pay fewer taxes why don't you just make less money? It'd be a shortcut. I mean, really? I was talking to a tax guy. He's like, this guy was so mad at me. He's like, why am I paying so much tax? He's like, because you're rich. I'm sorry. I mean, and I mean, it's 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 that way with a lot of things, though. Um, you know, I filled out the FAFSA. Well, my wife mainly filled out the FAFSA for financial aid. And I'm like, man, how can I hide that I have six, this 6,000 here? Mm-hmm. Well, you know, like that exposes something. in me. Mm-hmm. You know, people used to quick buy a car and then apply for financial aid. It was like, that's the scam, right? Like we're, we're living the scam because we want more and more, but we don't really appreciate what we have. Um, storage you know we all need we all need a storage space i mean when you drive around there are storage lots everywhere and there are people and and the these storage places they they know exactly how to work with this your first month is free because you're not going to need it more than a month but everybody forgets it's there they just pay the monthly bill and you think if i'm not even using it why do i have it Right. And so our cupboards, our, our closets, our garages are proof of what we need. Mm -hmm. So we just have to look back and he says, remember this. And this is, this is the thing that I think applies to that. The one's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. Our lives don't. And so within this story and what we know happens is, These possessions, they're just that. They're just stuff. And it's tricky because sometimes we lose it all and, you know, a fire can just take it all away in in such a little amount of time. Uh, A tidal wave in Japan can just wipe out millions and billions of dollars. Think about uh, Hurricane Katrina when when New Orleans kind of went through, it can be gone so fast. And that's what, what Jesus wants us to think about. Like you want it so bad, but your life doesn't consist of these possessions. And I was thinking, you know, what, what is it that our life consists of? And yesterday, um, one of the passages that that was used during the memorial service was talking about the riches of Christ, right? What is abundance in life? What is it? What is the essence of abundance? And if we go to Ephesians 3, uh, 8 to 10, this was the passage that um, Pastor Keller Jr. read. And it's just, it bears repeating. Chapter 3, uh, Paul says in verse 8, to me, though I am the very least of all the saints, this grace was given to preach to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. That is abundance, right? And there are many passages that refer to that. Where does contentment come from? Biblically, I think it comes from godliness, doesn't it? Godliness and contentment are linked together. Why is that? Well, to do the to do the Father's will. There is wealth in that. 
there is wealth in that. So that's what I think we want to, we want to see the positives here. We really want to look at where will our satisfaction be satisfied? It's in the Lord. It's in the riches of Christ, the riches of redemption, um, the richness of fellowship, of Christian fellowship, the riches of being free from the problems of sin and the guilt of sin. Uh, that's, that's kind of some of the things that I thought of. So that's how Jesus starts this section. Take care, be on your guard against all covetousness, for one's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. And he told them a parable saying, the land of a rich man produced plentifully. And he thought to himself, what shall I do? For I have nowhere to store my crops. And he said, I will do this. I will tear down my barns and build larger ones. And there I will store all my grain and my goods. And I will say to my soul, soul, you have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax, eat, drink, and be merry. So those, those personal pronouns, is that what those are? I and my are exposing a lot of what covetousness is. It's selfishness too, isn't it? It's a selfishness of what I want. It's what's mine. And um, in, in uh, Phil Riken's commentary, he's like, this guy's an atheist. If he's not even proclaiming it, that's exactly what he is. There is no God in this man's mind. Or if there is, it's a God that he does not see as part of his life in any way because it's his food or it's his barn or it's it's his future and it's his soul so jesus doesn't take that lightly either he kind of puts that into the passage doesn't he i've never i don't know if i've ever said to myself soul but that's really when i'm talking to myself i'm talking to my soul i'm talking about that part that it has to reckon with God, <laughs> right? We don't like to feel that way. I think that's why atheism is so so uh, popular for some is then they, they don't have to reckon with their soul. They can ignore that part. But God's put that in us. And so this man has, has definitely ignored it. It's so interesting, this conundrum, right? This guy's got the problem of too many taxes. He's got the problem of making too much money. And so he's making a problem out of that by, now I got to build more barns. I got to, like he could have, even in a worldly way, could have made his life better by, you know, uh, more financial donations. Then he could have maybe lowered his tax rate. Or something, maybe, I don't know. He could have given it away and they wouldn't have had to build more barns. But then he thought, wait a minute, wait a minute. This can take away my worries for the future. Which is uh, going to be coming up kind of in the next passage about not being anxious. <clears throat> so this guy is, he does have some anxiety for the future. So he's like, well, now I can get rid of those two. I can just store it up so that I have no possible way of having any problems. So his selfishness has come along and he can't see God. Um, that's something that, that we want to think about. Um, Psalm 14, verse 1, the fool says in his heart, what? There is no God. The fool. That is the beginning of foolishness. Whereas the beginning of wisdom is the opposite, right? The beginning of foolishness is to say there is no God. The beginning of foolishness is to think I can take care of this. Whereas, and we were just talking about with the Holy Spirit, how much does that change our perspective in life? Me versus what God can do, what God must do, and what I must rely on him for, Amen. right? Without God, our plans seem wise, right? In, in the Psalms and, and Proverbs, we really see that those kinds of, 
of things being played out. A man's ways seem good to him, right? We really, we do try to use our knowledge. We try to use our wisdom, but we kind of forget that, that, that there's gaping holes in it. Now, one biblical thing to do is to seek advice from each other because people have godly wisdom to offer to us. And that's a sign of humility, isn't it? When we'll go to someone else and say, this is what I'm thinking, but I'm willing to hear your view on this because I could be wrong or put it before the Lord. Lord, this is our plan. This is my plan. But maybe it's, maybe it's not wise or maybe I'm missing something. So I want to kind of just feed us. How do we stay on the right line of the kingdom of God? How do we handle abundance when we're part of the kingdom of God? Well, not to rely on that, not to see it as ours. I was talking to someone who was um, on the board of, of, a, of a, um, an organization, Christian organization, and they have some very, very uh, strong donors. But what, what really was remarkable to this person is some of these very wealthy people, when they're given thanks and credit, they'll say, it's not mine. And he goes, that's a godly attitude of someone who's wealthy, who gives their money, is to say, it's, it wasn't even mine. And I think that's rare, but that's, that's when you fall on the kingdom of God side of what possessions are for and, and how we're going to use them. Um, and not to be a fool. And then he says, but, you know, I think, you know, he says, eat, drink, and be merry. We see that his desire is really very, again, selfish, uh, seeing wealth in the worldly sense instead of the godly sense. Why is it that we sometimes want more for an easy life? Is that it? I, I think that's part of what I'm looking for when I'm when I'm thinking in the worldly ways. I'm looking at how much happier I think it'll make me, or I'm thinking about being worry-free. I'm just trying to th think about how is it that I might be thinking to myself, relax, eat, drink, be merry. Whereas that's not the way the kingdom of God thinks. But God said to him, fool, this night your soul is required of you and the things you have prepared, whose will they be? He can't take it with him. He can't take it with us. So we should lay up treasure, right? We should lay up treasure in a different way. We should not lay up treasures on earth, right? But we should lay up treasures in heaven. He says it in the negative in verse 21. So is the one who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. To say it in the positive would be, you know, to work for that which lasts and doesn't rust, that which can't be taken away. Work for that, that which lasts and to be rich toward God. What does it mean to be rich towards God? Um, there's different things that we could uh, say about that. And I want to just open it up for your, your thoughts. What do you think it would mean to be rich towards God? Some of it we've alluded to or I've alluded to, but as you've been contemplating this, what are your thoughts about this? How, what what is what's an example of how we do that? How do we lay up treasures? Mm -hmm. What other things do we do to lay up? Lay up treasures in heaven. I mean, we know that when souls are saved, that's a that's an eternal treasure and reward in their life. What, what are the things we do towards that <clears throat> motivation? Yeah. 
Let me give a good example of that, not seeing our money as our own, mm -hmm. but seeing it as his to be used for his kingdom. Yeah, what else? How can we tangibly do these things? Isn't the whole chapter really more about the leaven of the Pharisees? This is pharisaical. It's putting, it's putting self in front of everyone else. That's mm -hmm. exactly what 12.1 has to say when it talks of, I mentioned to you last week, the word trampling, para, I can't even think now. The, the Greek means another, all reading is to be rude toward one another. It seems so out of context, trampling, mm -hmm. but to be rude, running over everybody else for self. And that's exactly what we have here. We have right. this rich man who is, as the Southern Baptist says, the only place in the Bible that talks about retirement. Uh, he, he is for himself. And that was the Pharisee. I thank you, Lord, that I'm not like this man over here. So to be rich towards God is to put others first, to see our, our needs under what we can do for others. Yes. Um, Humble service yeah. to promote the extension and expansion of this kingdom. Yeah, yeah. So we want to have a good view of God's kingdom now even. How do we promote God's kingdom in people's lives today? Um, I'll read a section that Riken has. He says, but what would our lives be like if we weren't so stingy? What does it mean to be rich toward God? I am rich toward God when his glory is my highest goal. That's another aspect of it is giving glory to God instead of what this man does, thinking he's the one responsible for his rich crop. So giving thanks and glory to God for any abundance that we ever see or any work in our own life spiritually. When my when his glory is my highest goal, when his worship is my deepest joy, and when his fellowship is my greatest satisfaction. So it's to find satisfaction in who God is, even more than what he gave to me, right? Part of knowing the riches of God is knowing how he is glorious in and of himself. Um, I am rich toward God when I offer all my abilities for his work without reserve. I'm rich toward God when I take the time to serve people in need and give the first portion of everything I get to Christian ministry. So our tithing, our giving as being a desire that we want to do, not because we have to, but because we want that. We, we desire that that wealth to go to the Lord's kingdom work. Um, I'm rich toward God when I make the needs of the poor a priority and embrace a simple lifestyle that gives me more freedom for ministry. I'm rich toward God when I decide that there are some things I can live without so that I will have more to give to people who do not even have the gospel. I'm rich toward God when I give and give until I am and all I have is dedicated to his glory. To see our resources, you know, as something we want to put into service. So it could be our talents putting into service. It could be uh, our conversations being directed more towards God's glory. Um, so it, it takes a bit to really try to think about that in our work. How is our work and our, um, time, uh, giving towards that kingdom. And it can be, I do think it can be in just even thinking of like how the heavens declare the glory of God. It's, it's being a believer in thought, word, and deed in, in every part of our lives. That is, is something we can do no matter what our occupation is or no matter who we're with, right? 
Um, and we just have to kind of take, take those moments captive, take those thoughts captive to see how am I serving the Lord by being obedient to him and laying up treasure in heaven. And so I hope this is sort of like unpacking this section. Are there any other thoughts or comments you have about trying, trying to think of the positive, trying to see the negative of what we are trying to avoid, but also seeing the desire of what our theme is? Any thoughts about that? I just want to say I really like what you just now have emphasized. It's not about what we don't do as far as it's not just about what we don't do of treasuring, you know, and hanging on to all this stuff, but it's more about, and it's not even about how much we give to God's work and all, you know, yeah, that plays into it too, but it's about remembering who God is and whose we are and who takes care of us and how he deserves all the glory, all the praise, all of us, because He's God mm -hmm. and he loves us. He cares for us. And so in gratitude, we give him ourselves and we give him whatever, because we can, you know, he deserves it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Read the rest of the chapter. Yeah. Yeah. It really uh, continues to, to think through yeah. where it all comes from yeah. and, and what we should do with it. Let's pray. Mm -hmm. Heavenly Father, you are deserving of all praise. Mm -hmm. The riches that we have, Lord, they, when they are, are worldly, they fade. Mm -hmm. But when it is of your kingdom, it shines bright. It perseveres. It lasts. Mm -hmm. So may we use even our money, even our cars, our homes uh, to glorify you. Mm -hmm. Lord, may we not be stingy with those in need. May we be uh, seeing the things you give us as something from, from you and not our own. Mm -hmm. Lord, we thank you that our lives are not our own, but that our soul belongs to you. That when we, when we are forgiven, our soul is, is yours. And so we are completely safe. We are uh, free from worry mm -hmm. and uh, we can stand for you. We can have the Holy Spirit. We will have the Holy Spirit in us to uh, acknowledge you before men. Mm -hmm. And we pray that we would do that with our minds, our thoughts, our actions, our speech, and all that we do. May you be praised. We thank you that through Jesus Christ, all of this is possible. Mm -hmm. That um, through his uh, atoning work, through your spirit's work in our lives, through your salvation, this is all uh, possible. And so we give all the praise and glory to you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Hi, Belinda. Good to see you. The Lord bless you, keep you, and make his face shine upon you. I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording.